Hello everyone and welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium, the Northern Spotlights talk show, the talk show that brings you north. My name is Amanda, I'm going to be your host today and I am joined by Valeria Vergara, she's one of our research scientists here at the Vancouver Aquarium. Hello and welcome. Hi, thank you. We're really excited to have you here because Valeria uh, is one of our marine mammal researchers working with the belugas. Um, but before we delve into that, I have actually just been told that uh, <laughs> You oh. have this really neat thing on social media <laughs> called the Daily Crow. That's right. What is this? <laughs> well, you know, I am fascinated by intelligent creatures, social animals. Belugas are definitely very smart social creatures. So are crows, corvids, in fact. Um, so for about three years now, I've been uh, walking over with my dog to Trout Lake and photographing crows. And every day, or I try to, you know, every week at least, I post a picture, a good picture of a crow engaged in some cool behavior. Um, yeah, that's kind of amazing. A little hobby of mine. <laughs> Has this caught on, or a lot of more people appreciate crows? To some extent. <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Well, you can really see that uh, you like animals of all types. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And uh, you work with the belugas <laughs> here at the Vancouver Aquarium. So, yes. what's that been like? That's been great. That's uh, what got me started, essentially researching uh, belugas. I. Um, was a keen PhD student in 2002 when I studied the vocal development of a beluga calf that was uh, born at the aquarium back then and I followed his development for the first three years um, of his life. And I also looked at the function of beluga uh, calls. They are called the sea canaries for a reason. They have an extraordinarily large uh, repertoire of sounds. And uh, up until uh, then, we knew very little about the function of these sounds. Mm. Um, and so uh, here at the aquarium, we, we, through this work, we were able to identify one of the most important calls, which is the contact call that mothers and calf uh, use to communicate with uh, one another. Um, and that also adults in, in uh, use for uh, group cohesion, sort of to, to maintain or contact or, or regroup. Um, and then we took these studies to the wild. Um, so, and so where exactly have you been able to go? Uh, several places, uh, the St. Lawrence and uh, um, the Nelson River Estuary uh, were my initial uh, field sites where I was able to corroborate that these contact calls that are so important uh, are used by, by wild uh, belugas. And then more recently, in 2014 and 2015, uh, Cunningham Inlet, that is at the north end of Somerset Island in, in the high Canadian Arctic. Oh, wow. And so, th that's been wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So so was this your first time going up to the Arctic? It was, yeah. <laughs> and um, I think I actually have a video that you've given to me oh, of uh, some of those vocalizations. Great. Could you, I'll play it for us and then if you could tell us a little bit more about sure. what we're seeing. So here we go. Yeah. I love this video. <laughs> Yeah, so these are, um, it's just wonderful. I was standing right there. So this isn't with a zoom or anything. You're, you're standing there surrounded by whales and it's mostly mothers and their calves. Mm. So uh, this is the, the uh, Eastern High Arctic Baffin Bay beluga population and about 2,000 animals or so wow. come in every year um, throughout a period of about two to three weeks. And you can really hear their calls right now because I had a hydrophone uh, in the water connected to a speaker. Uh, so, you know, these sounds were actually happening underwater, but you can hear them um, because of the speaker that I had connected to the hydrophone. So were you able to hear that contact call that you heard here? Yes, yeah, so one of, the, one of the, the um, aspects of my research was to try and understand a little more about contact calls in a nursery area. If there's any place in the world where you would learn a little more about a call that is used between mothers and calves is a nursery, and this is a beluga nursery area. Um, so we learned that this uh, call is a, a predominant uh, call in their repertoire and that it increases in, in frequency. So it, it, they really, really use it in situations where the whales are separated from the rest of the group, which makes uh, a little bit of 
sense, right? Mm -hmm. So what happened this year in 2015 is that we had these natural channel entrapments where whales would uh, split off from the larger uh, herd or aggregation and they would come uh, up river canals and then the tide would go down and they would get entrapped in these river canals uh, for up to four hours at a time until the tide would come up again and they would be able to rejoin their group. And we don't know if they did this on purpose or, or if it was chance. They certainly seem to enjoy uh, getting up these river uh, canals. Um, and they didn't seem too upset behaviorally about uh, being stuck there, but they produced these contact calls most of the time in those canals. So 60 to 80 percent of their call repertoire in these entrapments consisted of contact calls. So it's a wonderful opportunity to do some really detailed research on the, the structure of these, of these contact calls. And I, there's a wonderful student, uh, Mary Anna, uh, working here at the aquarium uh, with me these days to help me analyze this data, which is it's very large volumes of data. <laughs> <laughs> so what's been the most surprising thing for you doing this research out in the field? Whew, I have to think about that. Um, it was interesting to see the degree of their sociality. Mm. Uh, these these I whales. A, a photo we can show actually oh, sure. of them being social. Here we go. There, that's ex that, that really that that picture really shows this. They are an incredibly tactile species. They w when you look around you and uh, there's whales everywhere. You see whales touching one another all the time. You know, uh, groups of males rafting together, uh, juveniles playing with each other and touching each other constantly, females side by side. Um, there's a very high degree of cohesiveness and, and uh, touch and social interaction. That's wonderful. Yeah. So when you are out there researching these animals, um, what is your setup like for all of your equipment? Well, I uh, do it in different ways. Um, I can study them from land, and I do that often, uh, where I'm just uh, um, either along a beach or on the delta when the tide goes down, and I'm literally standing on land with my hydrophone um, a few feet from me uh, in the water. Or I climb up a research tower I have that, a photo uh, of that. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so, yes, that's uh, myself setting up on this uh, research tower. and. Uh, uh, that's great. You can uh, wait until the tide goes down and uh, climb up the tower. And the trick is to get out of the tower before the tide gets too high so that you cannot longer get out of the tower and you're stuck there until the next low tide, which happened to me. Uh-oh. <laughs> can, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> sure. It was, uh, you know, simply that. I just didn't time it properly. Uh, so. Uh, it meant that I had to spend more hours than I wanted on that very, very small <laughs> research tower <laughs> surrounded by, by water and whales, which is a, a phenomenally beautiful experience, but very cold. This is the Arctic we're talking about. Yeah. So I was very happy to get, get off the tower at the end of that long day. <laughs> and you are up there in the summertime, correct? That's right, yeah. yeah. The Arctic summers are, you know, <laughs> probably as cold as our, our winters. <laughs> That's, if not more. That yeah. is very fair. And I have another photo of your setup of your camp. Um, That's right, yeah. Can, uh, so can you describe kind of what's happened sure. here? Sure. So you can see that this is completely frozen up. That's Cunningham Inlet, and it, it's Murphy's Law. I was there to, to study, um, you know, in part, this study has to do with the effects of noise um, on beluga whale communication, and noise that is brought about by global warming and the fact that ice is opening up and, and uh, giving space to you know, uh, navigation and, and all sorts of uh, human, uh, human access. But <laughs> in this case, this first, uh, first year of my research, it was a really late summer. Uh, it was just, the area was just completely frozen for longer than expected. So the first two weeks of my research there, there were no whales to be <laughs> seen. And this was uh, what the area looked like. Very different than the, the next year. I think you have a picture of that. I do, yes. So you can see this was 2015, very similar, to, you know, the same time of the year. I arrived on about the same dates. And this is what the uh, Delta looked like the second year. The, the whales arrived at the same day I did on the second year of research. So huge variability. 
of conditions. So with the research that you've been able to do in the Arctic, in the St. Lawrence, um, what are you hoping to um, go forward with that or what comes next for you? Um, so the, working on uh, several proposals uh, at the time, they all have to do with noise. Mm -hmm. um, this was a baseline area. It's one of the, the only areas where you can actually go and watch uh, belugas in undisturbed conditions. And in all of the, the weeks that I was there during research in 2014 and 2015, we had no boats. Uh, in the area, so there's no there's no noise, there's no anthropogenic noise. So it's a wonderful place to collect baseline data, which is very um, it is it's really lacking in acoustic research of beluga whales. And uh, so the next step is to go to take this study to noisy areas and see how their acoustic communication that we now understand so well. Um, because of this baseline research, how their acoustic communication can be compromised uh, potentially uh, by noise. Mm -hmm. And by identifying and knowing the function of a, of a sound that is very key, which is the contact call, we can zone into these calls and look at how this particular, the usage of these particular calls is affected. Um, do they have to increase the rate of production of these calls to be able to hear each other? Um, could, you know, uh, can mothers hear their calves uh, well? Uh, how far how far do these sounds uh, are able to transmit in the presence of noise? All of those things um, can be more easily answered in areas that are a bit more noisy, such as um, the St. Lawrence River. Mm -hmm. Um, and those other noises would be like boats? That's right. Uh, mm. So vessel traffic mostly. Right. Yeah. Well, that sounds really exciting and I hope you find out all the things. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we really, really look forward to you know, seeing more of what you're able to discover in these wonderful videos. But I would like to thank you so much for joining us for this Northern Spotlights talk show. You're very welcome. <laughs> and uh, for those of you that are tuning in again, thank you for joining us. If you would like to see more about uh, what the Vancouver Aquarium is doing up in the Arctic, there's lots of Northern Spotlights talk shows that you can see on YouTube. You can also visit our website, vanaqua.org slash our north to see uh, what else we are involved in. But thank you so much again for joining us and uh, have a wonderful day. My name's Amanda and take care. Great. Thank you.